Welcome to session four of Monterey Church's leadership training videos. This video is called Idols. Pastor Brian teaches that we need the Holy Spirit along with submission and surrender to truly be satisfied. There is no other way to live the Christian life or to satisfy the hunger the Holy Spirit gives us in making disciples. This video is a prelude to session four, Stages of D-Group Life. For more information about Monterey Church or to connect with us in any way, visit www.montereychurch.net. Enjoy. The first time I heard that song, it was on the Joshua Tree album, and it was in the 90s. And those of you who have heard me, if you've been coming to the church anytime, you've heard this part of the story, stay tuned, because there's going to be new stuff in a minute. But the first time I ever heard that song, I was just uh, finishing up my senior year at Florida State, which was really a year and a half, and I was down at my brother's house, and he had bought this new U2 album, Joshua Tree, and he put it in his, uh, he had a new BMW, I don't know if he stole the money or how he got it, but he got one. And he had a five CD changer and he had it in the, in the trunk. You put the CDs in the trunk and it would just randomly move around. And I borrowed his car and um, it was over Christmas break, but southern Florida, so it was nice and warm. And uh, I was sitting in a parking lot listening to the album because it was so good. And this song came up and I remember that it really resonated with me because it was like, I, I couldn't explain it. It was like singing the blues or soul. It seemed to articulate my heart. You know, at that period in my life, I was really, really searching. I don't think I understood it so well then as I do now, but I was really searching. And I was trying anything and everything, and I was at an age in my early 20s where I just went out and I went for it. I mean, I didn't just play around in the world. I went for the world, hook, line, and sinker. And I mean, I, I partied like a rock star at Florida State. I was about to get on a plane with my two best friends who were graduating from Georgia, and we were going to go to Australia and, back, and pack around uh, the whole country. And I mean, and I hadn't found what I was looking for, but I was quite certain that I would. I mean, I was quite certain that I would go around the world on whatever quest I had to go on to find what I was looking for. And what I really appreciated about the lyrics of the song was it did not live, the song doesn't exist in the absence of understanding God. And Bono and his Catholic upbringing, he understood that, you know, Jesus is real and the cross was legitimate and I believe that your kingdom will come and all the colors will bleed into one, that you will take your place on the throne and bring the entire world, every nation, every race under your authority. I even believe that you died on the cross for my sins and carried, you carried the cross of my shame and broke the chains and all of that. I understand the theology of the cross and I even believe it. And it really worked for me because I grew up in church and I, and I said the Nicene Creed every week and I believed it too. I didn't have a personal experience with God, but I believed it too. But like Bono, I still hadn't found what I'm looking for. And I can tell you as your pastor that I know that many of us here haven't found what we're looking for either. I can tell when you come to my office and talk to me. I can tell when I talk to you in the parking lot. I can tell by observing your lives. I can tell even sometimes by observing my own life that we many times have not found what we're looking for. Now we can say we found what we're looking for in Jesus, but our behavior says something entirely different, right? Because we are walking around like hungry beasts, seeking what we may devour. And because of our spiritual ignorance, we are caught up in all kinds of vain and misguided pursuits to seek a satisfaction that can never be found in this world. Once upon a time, there was a king, and it was King Solomon, and he was the son of David. And, and Scripture teaches us, at least at that time, that he was the wisest and wealthiest king in the history of Israel. And he had a strong knowledge of God. He even knew God. He had a powerful prayer life. But in spite of all of that, in spite of having everything, and knowing so much about God, and being so incredibly wise and wealthy, he, it makes it very clear in Scripture that he hadn't found what he was looking for. And if we read in the book of Ecclesiastes, we see him actually intentionally making a pursuit to find what he was looking for in this world. He wanted to see if there was anything under the sun that was worth it. And so he said that he kind of took on an experiment to find satisfaction to fill this insatiable desire. 
And he said the first thing he, he went for to try to find satisfaction and, and to feed himself, he went for pleasure. And, and it, the Bible says that even with his mind and his wisdom still guiding him, he kind of went for these things. It, he, he, even though he kind of had the ability to kind of come outside of himself and narrate the scene, it shows us that he kind of gave himself over to these things to see if he could find satisfaction. And so the first thing he, he tried to find satisfaction in was pleasure. This might be said another way for us, like sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Uh, what many of us pursue and what I was probably pursuing in my early 20s, those kind of things, those kind of things in this world to, to feed the senses. The reason that young people love to go to New York City or Vegas the reason that we get on airplanes and spend all kinds of money to create an experience that will completely fill our desires and to fill our senses. The reason that we go for the good-looking guy or the good-looking girl, even though they don't even love us. The reason that we do so many things. He went for that. Now, most of us go after that pursuit on a budget, don't we? We do it in college. And so we have to go to dollar beer night in order to, you know, do that. Uh, Solomon was different. He was rich. And so he was able to do it at a level we can't even imagine. He was able to do it more at the level of, you know, a rock star like you 2 or the Rolling Stones, who, by the way, couldn't find no satisfaction either. <laughs> and so he was much more successful in his pleasure than we were. I mean, the Bible says he had all these concubines and all these beautiful women. Like, he couldn't find what he was looking for, but most of us would think, surely you did, right? But he didn't. And when he came to the end of that, he said it's meaningless, meaningless, the chasing after the wind to try to seek satisfaction and pleasure. So he tried something else, and he tried some great building projects, and he built gardens, and he built temples, and he built palaces, and he built all these different things. And, and I can imagine one day he's standing on the roof of his own palace surveying all that his hands had done, and he looked over his entire kingdom, and he goes, it's awesome, it's cool, I'm glad to have it. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And you know, most of us have tried that too, but we were not as successful as him. We went out and tried to build our career and build our great projects, and most of us failed. And what we would say is, well, if I had only been successful, then I would have found what I'm looking for. But Solomon says, well, I went and did it right where you did it wrong, and just take my word for it. It's, you know, a chasing after the wind. Next thing he did is he focused on, you know, more living organisms and practiced his dominion through his flocks and his fields. And, and the scripture teaches us that he had more flocks and more fields and greater farms and he even began to build chariots and horses and he had just this incredible wealth through uh, agricultural things and through horses and through all this equipment. He even built a great army. And he had all of that, and still meaningless, meaningless, the chasing after the wind. After that, he said, well, let me practice some godlike dominion through people. And he took his slaves, and he caused them to be together and to procreate, and he built up an army of slaves, an army of servants, and even an army of citizens, all existing under his authority as the king. And that's not like president. You don't run every four years, and you don't have to pander. You just say what you want, and they have to do it, right? You're the boss. And he became wiser and wealthier, and he was adored by the masses politically, and he just, he, I mean, he was godlike to so many people. And yet at the end of the day, he said, meaningless, meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Wisest, wealthiest man in the history of the world, and he still hadn't found what he was looking for. In Ecclesiastes 2, just to capture what I just said, it says this, this is Solomon speaking. He said, I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. And Jerusalem was the high point of civilization at this time. It says, in all, of my wis in all of this, my wisdom stayed with me. As I gave myself to the world, I still had the ability to kind of understand and narrate and translate the experiment that I was in. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all of my labor. And this was the reward for my toil. Yet, when I surveyed all that I, my, my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. Everything was a chasing after the wind. Nothing, not one thing was gained under the sun. I still hadn't found what I was looking for. I can climb the highest mountains. I can run through the fields. I can scale the city walls to be romantically with you. I, I can hold the hand of the devil. I can try evil spiritual stuff. 
I can kiss her beautiful honey lips and feel the healing in her fingertips. And, you know, it was good for a moment, kind of like a hit of drugs. But the next morning I woke up and I was empty again. I still hadn't found what I'm looking for. And so I want you to know today that if you're sitting there in some, in some level of loneliness, despair, emptiness, hunger, you're in good company. You got Mick Jagger, you got Solomon, you got Bono, you got your pastor. You're in good company and you're in good company with people all around you. But today, let us pause for a moment and consider what it is that we really need. The Bible teaches us in Genesis 1 that we were created unlike anything else in all of creation. Not the animals, not even the greatest animals. The trees, the flowers, nothing in all of creation that is alive was made like you and I. And we were made greater than everything, not not by our strength, or even our looks, or even our intellect. As superior as it may be, the way we were made superior to the rest of creation was that we were created in the image of God. And what that really meant was we were created with the capacity to contain the person of God. We were, we were created with a spiritual dimension to us that the rest of the world doesn't enjoy. We were created not only to be physical, material, earthly vessels, but to be heavenly vessels and to receive through transcendence a portion of the glory or the image of God living in us through which God would provide dominion to the earth, authority. And so we were created perfect in the image of God, certainly underneath Him and submitted to Him, filled with His presence, His knowledge, His wisdom, His words, in order to have dominion over earth. And that spiritual light, that glory, His presence, His Holy Spirit, literally Christ in us, is our deepest need and our deepest desire. Now, as I say that to you, I bet you money you believe me. And as I say that to you, even if you haven't come to Christ, I bet that resonates with you a little bit. What you're hungry for and what I'm hungry for is the glory of God. And in the absence of real spiritual understanding, we go for the glory of this world instead, the vain glory that the devil promises us. And in the absence of understanding that it is the Creator that we need and we hungry for, we are tempted to go out into the world and try to fill those needs with created things instead. Solomon, Bono, Mick Jagger, Pastor Brian, filled with understanding perhaps theologically of who God is, yet still not finding what they were looking for because that image through sin had been stripped. The Bible says each and every one of us have sinned and fallen short of that glory from God. And in the process of that, we were made unholy. And when we were made unholy, that glory or the Holy Spirit was taken out of us. And we were left with empty, hungry hearts and the, and the lack of knowledge how to fill them. It's as if God is saying to us today, I know you believe in my blood, but do you believe in my spirit? I know you understand that the cross is the answer to everything, and apart from the blood of Jesus Christ and, and Him dying for our sins in a very theological and important way and cleansing us from those sins through His blood, that you can have no part with him. But did you know that he bled so that you might be fed the Holy Spirit? Do you know what you're looking for? And do you know how to receive it? Because as the blood purifies, it also gives us the capacity to understand words from God in his scripture. And it gives us the ability to desire those things. And it gives us the power in our understanding to submit to them. And it gives us, through submission, the ability to consecrate ourselves. And as we consecrate ourselves and devote ourselves to God, through righteousness, it gives us the power to re-receive the glory we were intended for. Fire falls in such a consecrated heart. And as I said during the offering, we perish without that knowledge. 
And even though many of us have come to the cross and been washed in the blood and indeed had the pilot light of his spirit reignited there, we've done very little to turn it up. Instead, we constantly and continually do things to grieve the Holy Spirit and to make him go dormant inside of us rather than to submit ourselves to him, yield to him, and see him flame up from the inside. And I'm telling you today, that's what you're looking for. I have good days and I have bad, and the good days are those days, and the bad days are when I'm out there just like you, running around trying to put something on the throne of my heart other than Almighty God. Look at Solomon's conclusion. He did eventually find what he was looking for, and it comes in such a simple way. In chapter 12, he says, Now that all has been heard, I've told you about my whole experiment and everything I did. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Here's the bottom line. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. And what is he saying? He's saying, I found contentment and satisfaction despite the incompletions of this world, in a right relationship with God. Righteousness is what we are hungry for. Righteousness is what we need. It's so unpopular to talk about. The word just freaks me out. But just know that it's simply this. Being rightly in relationship with God doesn't mean He's just my pal. It means He's my authority. He's my king. And understand that you don't achieve this, you just exist in it. You don't receive it, you you don't go and attain it, you receive it through the blood and the Spirit. Yet you do have a responsibility, an ability to respond in a way that is holy to gain it. I have this book and it it talks about the greatest 100 speeches in the history of the world. And it's a secular book and it has like great things like what Kennedy said or Winston Churchill or all these great historic figures, but the number one speech in this book, according to this book and to historians based on just an outside perspective, the number one speech in the history of the world was where Moses preached the Ten Commandments and delivered that to the, to the Hebrew people. The second greatest speech, according to these people, is where Jesus spoke at the Sermon on the Mount. In, in which you can read about in most of all the Gospels. And so, Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, Moses from Mount Sinai, and what I think is hysterical about that is they're actually the same sermon. They're the same sermon. There's, it's the Old Testament and the New Testament version. And so many people think, okay, Moses came and he brought the law, but Jesus came and he brought grace. Yes, but how did he bring grace? Now, do you remember this sermon? Now, I know this is not the Jesus you hear about in the New Testament church, you know, contemporary form very much, but did you know that when he preached the Sermon on the Mount, he not only referred to and drew from the Mosaic law, he expanded upon it. And he said, uh, you've heard it said, don't murder. And then he said, but let me tell you something. Every time you say something evil or bad or mean about somebody, you murdered them. And you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. But every time you look at a woman lustfully... You've committed adultery. Don't go to the mall because Victoria's Secret will, you'll, you'll commit adultery. Not me, because I'm holy, but you people might. <laughs> he expanded upon it. And Jesus said, Jesus said things like, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill the law. And he said, there's going to be some teachers coming around after me, and some of them are going to come, and they're going to preach like this kind of righteousness. And I want you to know, because they're willing to do that and be unpopular with you, because they're willing to pander to me instead of you, they're going to be called greatest in the kingdom of God. They're probably not going to have the biggest churches, but they're going to be called greatest in the kingdom of God. And my other uh, other teachers who are legitimately from me, who pander to you a little bit and teach cheap grace and not so much about the obedience, well, they're going to be called the least in the kingdom of God. He literally said that. And then he went into this whole thing, and it sounds like all he loves is poor people, but really, we're all poor in the eyes of God. And what he was basically saying is, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are poor and know it. What did Jesus say to the wealthy church in Revelation? You think you're rich, you think you've acquired everything you need, but really, from my perspective, perspective, you're wretched, pitiful, poor, naked, and blind. And so Jesus goes on this tirade. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs are the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who grieve and mourn. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst 
for righteousness. Blessed are those people like Solomon Bono, Mick Jagger, and Pastor Brian who still haven't found what they're looking for and one day are awakened to the knowledge that what they're looking for is God. And not just God, but a relationship with Him. And not just a relationship with Him, but a right relationship with Him submitted to their king because then they will have found what they're looking for blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they shall be filled with what the things of this world no with god and when jesus said i came to fulfill the law what he was saying this is so exciting is i came to bleed and to die and to cleanse not just cover sin but to cleanse men and women from sin and fill them with the holy spirit and transform them from the inside out so they don't even have to think about the law they just are the law they are just filled with love and not perfectly and not immediately but ever increasingly over time and my teachers like pastor brian today who teach that will be greatest in the kingdom of god glory to god that i have the wisdom one day to do that not only glory to god for that but we might actually begin to experience some breakthrough in this place now here's the essence of the thing here's the whole thing today anything or anyone we place too high in our life is an idol. Any created thing we go after to satisfy us other than God is an idol. And when we, when we have the wisdom to understand that what we hunger for is God and not these things and to transform our life and submit our lives and surrender these things to God rather than seeking them, then we have removed the idol. And we are entering into this place of righteousness and satisfaction with God. And when we don't, then we're not. And so blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, so much so that they'll allow themselves to be hungry until God fills them. And they won't run around trying to indulge and put all these things in the place of God in their life, but will cast those things down until God himself meets their need. Deuteronomy 5, verse 8, going to the, the best sermon, which is really the first part of the second sermon. 5, 8, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, on the earth beneath, or in the waters below. The essence of all sin is worshiping created things rather than the Creator. It's seeking, it's seeking satisfaction and fullness and created things and nouns. So maybe we chase people. Maybe we chase places. Maybe we chase things. Maybe we chase ideas. Maybe we chase philosophies. Maybe we chase careers. Maybe we chase achievement. Maybe we chase good health. Maybe we chase great wealth. Whatever it might be, these are nouns. Persons, places, things, ideas. Even if they're abstract, they are things of this world, of this earth. And when we chase them, we become worldly. So reading an article from Billy Graham in, in his, his very old state, and they were, they were, it was from a year or two ago, and they were asking him questions and they, about the state of the American church and the American Christian, and he said, we've become so worldly that he's afraid that if God wanted to do something significant in the world, he would just bypass us completely. And that, made, you know, that grieved him. Because we have these idols that stand in the place of God. We've become such a worldly people. We have so many devices. We have careers and we have education and we have money. And even in our, you know, our fallen back state of our economy, there are so many other things we can pursue before God. Drugs, alcohol, relationships, travel, things that seem good, spouses, kids. We can worship everything. I could worship that chair. We do it, right? If I could just get that satisfaction instead of going to God. And it says here, don't do it. Anything created, don't do it. Don't even make a picture of me and worship that. Sorry, Catholics. Don't do it. Don't worship the cross that you hang on your neck. Don't worship a picture of God. I'm too big for a picture. And you'll start thinking the power is in the picture. You'll start thinking that, you know, what some artist created is the thing that gives you power rather than understanding that no matter where you are, I'm there also. Create nothing. Worship nothing like that. Don't, I mean, in a sense, he was saying, don't even let the temple be that holy. 
In verse 9, it says, You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. I love that he says that. Because so many times, my image of God is that he's, he's just laid back, you know? He's just a laid back God. Whatever, I'm in control, I'm sovereign. la di da I don't care that much, I don't need him, don't care about him. No, he's intensely interested. And when he sees us running after everything under the sun except for him, it makes him mad. He gets hurt. He gets angry. Sizzling, red hot, mad, jealous. Punishing the children for the sin of the parents. I mean, sin generationally passes. The good news is in Christ. In a moment, it can be cut off. But it passes from the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But I show love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. Anything or anyone that sits on the throne of God, which is your heart, instead of or over him, is this kind of an idol. And you need not be an ancient person who literally creates idols to be, to, to be guilty of the sin of idolatry. You simply need to be a person that seeks anything before or instead of God or even after God rather than God to fulfill your needs. It's as simple as that. Uh, two weeks ago, I was in Virginia. I was traveling. And I was at my hotel one afternoon, and I had a lot of work to do. I had sermons to write and things to prepare for, but nothing urgent. And I didn't have any meetings for one day. So I had like a 24-hour period where I didn't have anybody around me. I, I wasn't around my church, and I wasn't around my family, and I wasn't around my staff and all the people that are normally around me. And I became kind of lonely. I began to long for, you know, the people in my life. You guys, the church, my staff, and mostly my wife and my kids. And, and I was really, I was hungry for them. And I was just, man, I wanted to get on the phone, and I just, I wanted to, and I, I even asked, I mean, I began to think, do, do I, should I even be here? Maybe I should go home to be with my family. That would be better than being here and being lonely. And it was just this emptiness, right? And, and it was this hunger. And I began to figure out r- really quickly why so many men fall to sin in hotels. Because they're alone, and they're lonely, and they're hungry, And what do you have there? You have porn on the television, you have alcohol in the lobby, and you have a bunch of other women who are lonely and not in traveling as well. Now, I'm not about to confess anything. I didn't come close to sinning. I was just saying I could see how other people would do that. And I'm sitting in this hotel alone in the world, and there's so many things out there that I could go and consume to fill up this hole, or I could just simply go home and consume my family. But it was as if God was saying, "Uh uh-uh, consume me. And then I came under conviction about my relationship with my wife and kids. Now, hear me out on this. This is going to be scandalous. God began to show me that if I ran home to them rather than running to him, that was idolatry. As much as a gift from God is my wife and my kids, when I put them in a place where God alone belongs, I, they, I made them an idol. And then he began to show me from, from the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are you when you hunger and thirst. Because every single time you hunger and thirst, you hunger and thirst for one thing primarily, that's me. Blessed are you when you hunger and thirst and have the wisdom to know you're looking for righteousness. So I took that hunger, and I took that emptiness, and I took that loneliness, and I just allowed it to remain. I, I realized that it was the throne of my heart and it was sitting empty. And then I sought God to fill it. And as I did, he absolutely filled me. I wasn't lonely. I wasn't tempted. I wasn't afraid. I was filled. And ironically, what a twist. Not only was I filled, treasure was left there. I mean, a well, I mean, I wrote like three sermons on steroids, this one included. And, and, and he filled me up with love, not just for him, but for my wife and my kids. I mean, he left treasures in me to feed them with. But what he didn't do was let me worship them first. And then I understood why it teaches in Scripture that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to seek his Father. He, he's like, I want to be hungry. I need to be hungry. 
A meal tastes better when I'm hungry. And the meal was his father. And as much as Jesus loved us and was willing to die for us to serve us, even, even, even though we're his bride, the Bible says, we were not his idol. And your bride or your groom or your kids or your boss or all the wonderful people around you that you're called to love, that you're not called to worship them. You're called to worship God. And as you seek him first, he will fill you up with treasure, with love, with power to love them as well. And I had this moment and I was like, oh man, I'm so thankful. Thank you, Lord, for giving me that wisdom. Thank you for the satisfaction that comes from feasting on your word when I'm hungry. Because when my senses are filled and I'm, I'm kind of numb in the moment, when I, you know, you've taken the pill literally or figuratively to make you numb, you still have the need, but when you don't recognize it, you don't feed it in exactly the same way. It's not as powerful. Here's the verse that really leapt out to me in our quiet time this past week. It's from Isaiah 30. And Isaiah 30 was written to the Hebrew people at a time when they, had, they were fully engaged in the judgment of God. They had been terribly guilty of idolatry, of worshiping people, places, things, and ideas, and religious systems, rather than worshiping God. And because God loved them, as we talked about last week, He didn't leave them over to their own devices. He didn't leave them over to their own images and their own idols. If God didn't love us, He'd just say, yeah, go satisfy yourself with, you know, Sex, drugs, rock and roll, wealth, your job, your career, your projects. Just go knock yourself out, think you're fine, and find out one day you're not. But when he loves us, he allows us to come to the end of ourself. He brings crisis so that we'll bow down and surrender to him and gain the wisdom that we're talking about today. And that's what he did for the Hebrew people. He took them through that entire process that he takes us through collectively sometimes and individually. He let them come to the end of themselves, to the end of their devices. But here is the grace and their, and their time of brokenness. Here is the, like, the love letter that he wrote to them. And I think through them to us. He said, people of Zion who live in Jerusalem, you will weep no more. When? We'll get to that. It says how gracious he will be when you cry for help. As soon as he hears, he will answer you. And so God might be coming to us today and he might be looking at us in the circumstances that we exist in. He might be looking down at our situation and he might just take ownership for the things that we're struggling with. What does it go on to say? This is, this is amazing stuff here. It says, although the Lord gives you, I gave it to you, the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. I gave you adversity and I gave you affliction. Though I gave it to you, your teachers will be hitting no more. With your own eyes you will see them. I'll bring you up out of that. And it says, God saying to us, I've allowed some things to really bring you down so that you would come before me in a submitted position so that I might fill you with myself and lift you back up. But don't miss it. This is the greatest opportunity of your life. Let the crisis lead to surrender. I mean real surrender. I mean righteousness and transformation. And you don't have to do it legalistically from the outside in. You don't have to go and follow 10 rules for a holy life. Just bow down. Get righteous. Don't go seek all these other things. Wait and be hungry. Hunger and thirst and aim it and guide it at me. And as you do, God is doting. He's just hanging there. He can't wait to restore us. It was like he was hovering over the Hebrew people going, I just, as soon as you make me your God again, like I'll be your God again. And I'll begin to take care of you and I'll bless you. I've, I've brought this devastation to reform your relationship with me and thus your relationship with everything else. And I can't wait to rebuild your life, but we got to get this in order. And so how is he going to do it? How is he going to bring the blessing? He's going to do it by speaking it into existence first. It says in verse 21, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. It goes on to say, then you will desecrate your idols overlaid with silver and your images over, uh, covered with gold. You will throw them away like a minstrel cloth and say to them, away with you. Now here's what he's saying. When you submit to me, when you cry out to me for help, 
when you pause and realize that your hunger and your thirst is for righteousness and your, your thirst for righteousness is, is for me and you come to me in a right relationship and you cry out in your pain, immediately I will hear from heaven. And because of the blood of Jesus Christ, I will answer your prayer. But here's how I'm going to answer it. First, I'm going to show you who your teachers are. Who are the real shepherds? Who are the real preachers? Who are the real prophets all around you? And, and in, in our generation, what is that? Through Scripture. My, our teachers are, 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 are the apostles who were with Jesus, filled with his Holy Spirit, and as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, wrote his word. And then the teachers in this era, like Pastor Brian and many, many others all around here, who teach under the authority of that word and bring it to you. And this is how I'm going to begin to answer your prayers, because what I want to do is I want to speak it first. I want to promise it and then you receive it. I want to give you correction and instruction, and through obedience and through righteousness, I want you to be blessed. This time, I want you to see the source, not just the supply. I'm going to bring the source through my word first, and then I'm going to bring the supply. And you're going to see, oh, I see how it works. I obey, and God gives me everything I need. And even when I don't get what I want, I am satisfied simply with what I need. Because what I'm really hungry for is Him. And not them are not that. And so he says, you'll know it. And and, and here's here's the real blessing. You won't wonder who are the real prophets and who are the false prophets because what does it say about our era? And this scripture is very much foreshadowing or prophesying the New Testament church, the New Jerusalem. What is he saying to us? He is saying, you will all know me. As another prophet said, from the least to the greatest, they will all know me. Now, it doesn't mean we always agree because sometimes our flesh is fighting. But when we're in the Spirit, our Spirit will bear witness with their Spirit. Our Spirit will bear witness with God's Word, even as we read it without a teacher. And we will, we will see it with our own eyes, and we will hear it with our own ears, and we will say amen, like Pastor Rowe does so much. And it will echo, and it will resonate, and we'll know it's true. And we might even become that teacher ourselves. The truth of the matter is, the teacher is the Holy Spirit through God's Word. Literally alive and all around us. And he's saying, here's what I'm going to do. Before you were like infants, you couldn't understand anything. But now you'll understand through your, your affliction and through your submission, I will bring a blessing and it will begin invisibly but really by my Holy Spirit through words and through your obedience and receiving it by faith, this grace will flood into your life and you'll never again commit idolatry. Because no matter what I give you, you'll know the source separate from the supply. And you'll know that when you're hungry, none of that supply will do. The only thing that will do is being in the presence of your Father. And he goes on to say, And he will also send you rain for the seed you sow in the ground, and food that comes from the land will be rich and plentiful. Now, in one scene, you're taking all that plentiful, abundant stuff that you had before, and you're seeing it in the light of the gospel as just rubbish compared to your relationship with Jesus. Paul said, I consider everything rubbish compared to knowing Christ and Him crucified. In one sense, you throw it down as unholy and ungood, right? And in the next scene, though, now that it's been thrown down, we can receive it again because it's just a blessing from God and not God Himself. And so, now I can give it to you. Because you understood that that's not the thing. In that day, cattle will graze in broad meadows. That was good stuff for them. Not so relevant for us. The moon will shine like the sun, and the sunlight will be seven times brighter. I mean, I am going to bask you in my presence. Light of seven full days. When, I love this, the Lord binds up the bruises of his people and heals the wounds he inflicted. But God never does evil. That's not evil. When God afflicts us and inflicts us or allows things to come into our life to bring us down, it's all for good. All things work for good for those who are called according to his purposes and love him. Everything is good from God. But don't rush off to assume that the source of your current affliction is evil. It might be God. He might be bringing down your world so that you will fill up with him. Scripture says, what is it to gain the world? What is it to gain every idol and be filled with them and forfeit your soul? And what I would say is, better to lose the world and gain your soul, your spirit filled with the Holy Spirit and righteousness before God, than to gain the world and think we're fine. Only to wake up one day in the presence of God at His judgment seat 
and see that he never knew us. I've had a lot of appointments lately and I've been pushing them really close together because I've been traveling to start this other church. And so some days get kind of overwhelming because I get a lot of people circling through really fast and with the emails and the phone calls and the things I hear and the things I experience in counseling and keep bringing them on. Like, I'm your pastor. I'm okay with that. But I mean, sometimes it gets really overwhelming, right? Like, I forget what my problems are because I'm so consumed with yours. And the other day I was just thinking, man, all right, I got a lot of work to do. We're going to have to have church every day because I got to preach on relationships between husbands and wives. And I got to preach on relationships with our children, both small and grown up. I got to preach on our relationship with our enemies, our relationship with our friends. I need to preach about our relationships with each other in the church. I need to preach about our relationship with our boss and with people we work with. I need to preach about our relationship with the body of Christ and those outside of the body of Christ, the world. I need to teach people how to be in the world and not of it, how to have a right relationship in all those different areas. I need to teach people about their relationship with money, and then I need to teach them about their relationship with this world as far as status. And I mean, I had this list, and I'm like, I'm going to be, I gotta, we got to meet like every 10 minutes. This is overwhelming. I was just getting exasperated. I'm like, I feel so inadequate, Lord. And I'm telling you, man, seek first the kingdom of God because everything else will be added unto you. As I sought God, he goes, I got it. Silver bullet, one, one sermon. Teach them about their relationship with me and all those other relationships will fall into place. Teach them to take all those things and cast them off of my seat, out of my throne, and then I will take up my place in their heart and they will be filled with the knowledge and the counsel and the love and the power and the wisdom of God all the time. And then teach them to yield to that authority within them. In other words, do your new mission statement that you've been telling everybody about. Reestablish the authority of God in the hearts and minds of his people. Seek first the kingdom. By seeking first the king and all of its righteousness and right relationship in this way and all these other things, all those 80 million other sermons that at some point you might preach will fall into place. But you can't just get up there and tell people, hey, here are 10 rules for making your marriage great. First thing you need to do to make your marriage great is get it off its throne. Cast it down. It's not the most important thing. It's a very important thing, but it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is not your bride or your groom. The most important thing is to understand that we are the bride of Jesus Christ. And that marriage is meant to last for eternity, not just for a few years on earth. And ironically, by the way, it's the best thing you can do. Quit worshiping your kids. By worshiping your kids, you're committing idolatry and you're cursing them to the third or fourth generation. But if you quit worshiping them and start worshiping God himself, instead, he'll leave you treasure to give to them and you will create a spiritual heritage to last a thousand generations. So hard as a pastor when people blame their unfaithfulness on their wife or their kids because you're like, well, I can't really interrupt that. Well, God today is saying, I interrupt it. Seek me first. Mine and Elaine's marriage isn't perfect, by any means. It's a lot better than you probably think it is, because I'm sure as women you look at me and go, who would want to be married to that guy? That would just be a piece of work, wouldn't it? And you know, as imperfect as it is, I think it's better than it's ever been. And I remember when we were getting ready to move out here and start this church, and and it felt like every book I read said, you better make sure your marriage is perfect before you plant a church, otherwise it's going to get destroyed. And maybe you know, there's some triage to do, and it needs to be pretty good. But there was no perfecting it before obeying God. We had to obey God, and as we sought first the king, we were amazed to see his grace flow into our lives. And I was watching a prominent pastor the other day on YouTube, and he was doing a sermon to his church about marriage, and I didn't want to, I just, last thing I wanted was a sermon about 10 things that I need to do that I probably won't do to make my marriage good. But I've watched it anyway out of guilt, right? Anybody ever been there, right? Like somebody's like, you should go to this marriage conference. You're like, I don't want to go. They're going to tell me to do things that I just won't do. And that's kind of where I was, but I'm like, you know what, I need to be more righteous than that. And so I listened to it, and I was amazed to hear this pastor say the exact same thing to me as I just said to you. He said to them, men and women of God, Brothers and sisters of God, 
Husbands and wives, if you're waiting till your marriage is perfect before you start serving God, your marriage will never be perfect. It'll never even get any better. But if you'll begin to serve God and place Him at that highest place in your heart, then your marriage will fall into place. And it may be that what you're looking for in your spouse, you're never supposed to find in your spouse. And what you're looking for in your children, you're never supposed to find in your children. And what you're looking for in your job, and what you're looking for in your career, and in your health, and in your achievement, and all of that, those are wonderful gifts as long as they're not idols. You're not supposed to find them there. You're only supposed to find them in Jesus. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but inherit eternal life. And I'm telling you, that doesn't simply mean some belief system in the blood. That means inheriting and re-inheriting the gift of the Holy Spirit. A body from spirit does slowly unwind until we are all spirit in the end. And if at that point we have not been washed in the blood and filled with that Holy Spirit, then we will entirely perish along with our with our bodies, but if we are filled with the Holy Spirit, then we will resurrect and we will be alive again. And God would come to us today and say, and Jesus, I believe, would say, the joy set before me was not simply seeing you pass the test at the end, the theological test at the end, but for that eternal, abundant, spiritual life to begin now on earth as it shall in heaven. And if you don't see anything, you should be scared to death. Paul said we better test ourselves and see if we're truly in the faith. Today, I just pray that the Holy Spirit would come to you and he'd say, that's your teacher, at least today. That's my word to you today. And that he would further and specifically instruct you in every area of your life as he sees fit.